Today's video is partially sponsored by Outs. Outs is a growing general store, providing essential items for those out active. Today, they released a new item. These hood tech military cargos. These is fire. A lot of you don't know how to dress these days and you know it. Some of you are old heads, out of touch, and don't know what to buy, so get these. Also, if you're not one to wear shorts in the summer, these joints will provide you with some style. Just make sure you got on some good feats though. These are $18, light bread. Get yours, they have them in different colors. We got ours already. From 2006 to 2016, the 18 Park Gang operated primarily in and around the Patterson Houses, a New York City public housing development in the Mott Haven area of the Bronx. Members of 18 Park sold crack cocaine and marijuana on a near daily basis, turning the area in and around the Patterson Houses into an open-air drug market. 18 Park members used firearms and violence to assert the gang's control over the area. They adopted the 18 Park name due to the hangout area and territory-based area the school zone, PS18. The territory was also known as Spanish Block. In addition, the crew was called YM for young money and was also YG a but the relationship soured in the mid-2000s because of an unresolved issue. They often feuded with the YGs from the first side of the Patterson houses. That branch of YGs was known as the Square Gang. If you look at the geography of the Patterson houses, you can see 18th Park in this area, where the 18th Park members hung out. The first side, consisting of the basketball court, is where Square Gang members congregated. The local buildings that surrounded each of these territories were gang members as well. Because of 18th Park's close proximity to Kirtland Avenue, they had a few run-ins with the Kirtland Avenue crew, or the OGs, who were a few blocks away in the Jackson and Melrose projects. Although the Square Gang was YG, there was a rouge period where they also rivaled members of the YGs from the neighboring Mott Haven houses. They also feuded with McCombs Road and common YG rivals, such as the Mitchell houses and Kirtland Avenue. Before we get into the meat of the story, pause, we must note this for people who are outside the scope of things. 2011 had a lot to do with the YG split and birth of the OGs, so the early portion of this story is before all of that stuff. The upcoming events take place in the vicinities of the housing developments mentioned above. We will talk of some of the major players we had not elaborated on that harbored and contributed to the furtherance of what we will call the Mott Haven Wars. Anyway, back to the story. Keyes was born on October 10, 1987 at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx area of New York City. His biological mother became the primary and, eventually, the sole caregiver and provider for Keyes and his two siblings. His biological father was Mike. For the first seven months of his life, Keyes had the benefit of having both biological parents under one roof. The first apartment where the family lived was located at 324 East 143rd Street in the Bronx. This unit in the Bronx was the home where his mom's had been raised it was her parents' apartment. This apartment was located in the Patterson Housing Complex in the Bronx, which was part of the New York City Housing Authority. There are 15 separate buildings that make up the Patterson Housing Complex, which jointly contain approximately 1,800 apartments. The Patterson Houses were essentially low-cost housing for residents of New York City, and not unexpectedly, were rife with drugs, gangs, and plagued by high rates of criminal activity. After several months of living with her mother, his moms, Mike Keese and his older brother, moved to a nearby apartment located at 315 East 143 Street in the Bronx essentially, across 143rd from her mother's apartment. This was a pretty small apartment, but at least the family had their own living space. It also was in close proximity to her mother's, which as time unfolded, turned out to be extremely helpful in terms of childcare matters. Another reason for keeping her family in the Patterson projects was that it was economically possible for his moms to live here. The reality of her economic circumstances was compounded due to an unexpected tragedy that occurred when Keyes was about seven months old. On June 1, 1988, less than a year after his son was born, Mike was killed in a shooting incident in the Bronx. Michael, who was a hotel maintenance worker, was at work when he was shot and killed during a robbery. While his moms cared for and raised Keys, Mike obviously was never really a part of his son's life emotionally or financially. At such a young age, outwardly, Keys appeared to be unaffected by the murder of his father. However, as time progressed, this loss came back to haunt this young man. 
for his moms, the loss was felt more immediately it was during this early period after Mike was murdered, and she had two young sons, that Keith's moms was forced to turn to social services for assistance. This was the only time in her life that she was not working and able to support herself and her children. When Keith was about two years of age, his mom's significant other at the time, Bill, moved in with the family. Bill remained part of the household with his moms and her sons for about the next 12 years. Because the apartment was not that large, Bill was not always in the household. He also was not financially supportive. This is the period when his moms was forced to turn to social services as a way to support herself and her two children and the third child, Day Day, born in 1990. After staying at 315 East 143th Street for approximately four years, the family moved to another location in the Patterson Projects 308 East 145th Street. The apartment was a bit larger to accommodate his moms and her three sons, but outside the environment remained the same. And, while Bill still was involved with his moms, he never contributed much to the family. That role fell to his moms who began to work and build a career for herself. Keith was around age 6 when the family first moved to this larger unit at 308 East 145th Street, and his mother began spending much less time at home. During this time, 2000, his moms got her degree and was working full-time. Years passed before Bill exited their life. He had always worked on and off through the years and never held a steady job. Near the end of his tenure with his moms and the boys, Bill began using drugs and became physically abusive. In fact, shortly before he left for the last time, Bill was using angel dust. Keith was approximately 14 at this juncture, so he had been exposed to Bill and his deleterious influences for about 12 years in total. As Keith moved into his early teenage years, he spent more time with his friends on the streets outside the Patterson projects, and less time inside supervised by his mother. He and his friends had grown up in Patterson together. They attended school together and played sports together. In fact, Keith was active in several types of athletics and often played at the Mott Haven Community Center. On the downside, it also was around this time, at about age 14 that Keith first began smoking marijuana. Eventually, his moms moved in with a cousin for several months. Keith's older brother had left home already, and Keith had moved in with his fiancée at her grandmother's apartment around Pelham Parkway North in the Bronx. They would be there for about two years. Eventually, his moms moved into another apartment located near Evergreen Avenue in the Bronx. Outside of the few months she spent at her cousin's apartment, this was the first time in her life that his moms had lived outside of the confines of the Patterson houses a community, plagued by crime, drugs, and gangs. The same went for Keys when he moved to Pelham. For the first time in his life, the streets outside his home were not filled with chaos and danger. In May 2002, his older brother got his high school diploma and went on to John Jay College. While he still knew people from where he grew up in Patterson, he developed a new social circle once he began his education in Manhattan. Like his older brother Keyes would achieve his high school diploma in June 2005. Regardless of his success at Park East, this was not Keyes's first choice for a high school. Keyes wanted to emulate his brother Michael and aspired to attend the Leadership and Public Service High School in Lower Manhattan. He did well in school and wanted to follow his brother. However, when it came to applying to the school, he was told he had to go to his own school. He had no support from his counselor or teachers. Keyes recalled feeling abandoned and both discouraged and hurt that he was unable to get into the same school as his brother. He even reflected on how things might have been different if his father would have been alive to support him. Nonetheless, Keyes did well at Park East and after graduation decided to go to college. He chose to attend the State University of New York, Farmingdale, where he enrolled in business administration. He began in the fall of 2005, but left after a single semester. While Keyes was interested in earning a degree, the logistics of the commute as well as the economic realities of his situation intruded on his dream of higher education. Farmingdale was a lengthy trip on public transportation from the Patterson houses, and money for travel as well as tuition was a problem. This foray into the world of college coming from the South Bronx seemed doomed to failure at the start. So, college was expensive, and it quickly moved out of reach for Keyes. He was aware that his mother worked hard to provide the basic necessities for the family, and he was unwilling to infringe further on her earnings. Keyes had worked at a number of jobs during high school. The Parks Department in White Plains and McDonald's. 
After leaving Farmingdale, he looked for employment and had a couple of odd jobs throughout the times. All of these jobs were short-lived, he earned less than $8,100 in total throughout this two-year period. At one point during the summer of 2006, he even relocated to Columbia, South Carolina, to stay with cousins for a fresh start. He got a job and contemplated finishing school, but it was difficult in a house full of people. Living down south was foreign to him, and that without transportation, he was unable to get around. Around 2006 to 2007, once he returned to the Bronx, Keyes contacted the Building Works Construction Pre-Apprenticeship Training Program in Lower Manhattan. He had spotted a flyer for the program and thought the initiative sounded interesting. He took a chance and applied to the program, and he was accepted. At this point, he was knocking out certifications left and right. Even with this, jobs were limited and although he had skills, there wasn't many places to apply them. By listening to the story, you can hear that he made an effort, even with the odds stacked against him. He too, like many others, would not be able to escape the pitfalls of the South Bronx. During this time, he was in the streets, and so was his younger brother, Day Day, who was three years younger. They would go on to do their biddings for 18 Park. In fact, for the crimes that Keyes was involved in, he was the only one that didn't cooperate with the government in connection to the murders he would be involved in. This story is not solely about Keyes, although his status rose over time, so let's get into it. 18 Park members, including Day Day, Keyes's younger brother, protected the gang's territory and asserted its superiority to other gangs in the neighborhood through violence. In 2006, in the vicinity of East 138th Street and 3rd Avenue, Day Day, while with other 18 Park members, pulled out a gun and shot at individuals who were residents of a neighboring housing development, the Mitchell Projects. No one was hit during the shooting though. Corey was a leading member of 18 Park and was involved in both violent and narcotics-related conduct. He used 18 Park stash houses and sold drugs for the gang. Corey had access to large quantities of drugs, so he enlisted 18 Park members to sell drugs for him, including crack cocaine and marijuana. He also supplied guns to 18 Park members. Some of the guns that Corey supplied to other members were used to shoot at rivals. In one of those shootings, 18 Park member, Rara, was shot in the crossfire and seriously injured. Bebo became a member of 18 Park when he was only 17 years old. At that time, 18 Park was primarily involved in the dealing of narcotics and was closely aligned with a neighboring group, the Young Gunners. In late 2008, Bebo was charged with the murder of Brandon Howard. Brandon Howard did not grow up in the Patterson houses and was a relative newcomer to the area, having recently come to live with relatives there. He was considered by those who knew him or simply observed him on the streets to be a very troubled young man with a serious substance abuse problem, a hair trigger temper and always armed with a gun. Local residents interviewed by the defense described him as dangerous, noting that they generally would cross to the other side of the street or enter a store when they saw him, as he was prone to recklessly discharging his weapon, seemingly for no reason. He was known in the community by the nickname Be High, a moniker he consistently lived up to. Local residents interviewed by the defense also commented that B. High's own relatives expressed concern that he would be killed on the streets because of his unpredictable and aggressive behavior and believed that B. High had moved from Brooklyn to the South Bronx as he was wanted for a murder in Brooklyn. In the weeks preceding the Brandon Howard murder, Bebo became aware that Howard was angry with him because of a temporary casual relationship Bebo had with Howard's then-girlfriend. Then, one afternoon, Bebo was sitting on a park bench in front of the Patterson houses with several friends, including a friend nicknamed White Blood, from a different area of the Bronx and not a member of 18 Park. They spotted Howard walking down the street towards them. Bebo and his 18 Park friends immediately became attentive to Howard's movements, given his reputation for violence and his anger at Bebo. The minute they saw Howard's hand move towards his pocket, they jumped off the park bench and ran for protection in the closest Patterson building. White Blood, unfamiliar with the area, began running up the block. Howard chased White Blood up the block and shot him in the back, killing him. Soon after this incident, 18 park members became involved in a dispute with Howard over his possession of an 18 park gun. This exacerbated the bad blood between 18 park members and Howard. Soon thereafter, on the evening of September 28, 2008, Day Day attended the party with 18 Park member, Jason, and observed that Brandon Howard was present at the party. 
Day Day and Jason then left the party and reported to other 18 park members, including Debebo, that Howard was at the party. At the time, Day Day knew that those 18 park members had a beef with Howard, and that they would likely use the information about his whereabouts to retaliate against him. Bebo brought a gun to the party. Bebo was at home watching a fight on television with friends when he received word that Howard was attending a party in a recently vacated apartment in one of the Patterson houses. Bebo asked Howard to step outside to talk to him in the hallway in an alcove near the building's elevator. Key served as a lookout for Bebo, as Bebo confronted Howard in the hallway immediately outside the party. Although Howard was armed, Bebo was faster on the draw, and immediately shot at Howard multiple times before Howard could take a good shot at him. In the pandemonium that followed, Howard's brother who was also at the party, grabbed the gun from Howard's hand, and fled the scene. Bebo also fled via another staircase before the police arrived. Bebo was arrested in December, 2008 and charged with the murder of Howard based upon the accounts of two girls who were present at the party. The charges were subsequently dismissed when the witnesses recanted their prior statements, maintaining that although they were present at the party, but they did not actually witness the murder. Bebo spent 41 months in state custody on the murder charge, being released from custody on May 18, 2012. When Bebo returned to the Patterson houses, he found that the affiliation between 18 Park and the YGs had deteriorated and become competitive and violent. The two groups were at war. His childhood friend and co-defendant, Keyes, was now one of the leaders of 18 Park and Bebo soon thereafter resumed his membership in the organization and became a co-leader of the group with Keyes. Within a month of Bebo return home, Howard's brother came to the block looking for Bebo. Bebo. His homie Will spotted him and shot at him, but the brother survived this attack. Jason, 18 Park member, was on the come up. Jason was the member who notified Bebo of Howard's whereabouts, although he was not in attendance when Howard was murdered. Jason recruited others into the gang, engaged in a number of shootings personally, including shooting into a crowd and injuring two pedestrians in 2009. He also sold drugs with the gang. He would go on to do four years shortly after this. This same year, 2009, Corey shot at individuals whom he believed to be members of a rival gang, in fact, he shot fellow 18 Park member, Naughty. On August 4, 2009, Day Day, with another dangerous member, T. John and Will, set out to commit a robbery, but were unsuccessful. By 2011, the beef between 18 Park and Square Gang would start up and begin to get violent. On May 23, 2011, Day Day and other 18 Park members went into the territory that their rival gang, the Square Gang controlled, in order for another 18 Park member to shoot a Square Gang member. Day Day helped to point out a rival Square Gang member, and another 18 Park member shot at him. The Square Gang member was hit in the leg. Less than a week later, a murder would take place. On May 29, 2011, Keyes drove another 18 Park member, Wally, to the vicinity of 2625 3rd Avenue, so that Wally could shoot and kill a rival. Wally did not shoot a rival gang member, but instead fired his gun into a crowd and killed 16-year-old Johnny Moore. After the shooting, Keyes drove Wally away from the scene of the crime. There was another story as to how and why this happened though. Johnny Moore, the well-known talent on the basketball courts of Mott Haven, was slain not long after he was victorious over another young man in a one-on-one -on -one game for cash. They were playing basketball for money. He won and the other kid wouldn't pay. Investigators believed Moore was walking toward a store near 3rd Avenue and East 141st Street about 11.10 p.m. when he ran into his recent opponent, who continued to refuse to fork over the money. The two argued, prompting the sore loser, Wally, to whip out a gun and fire several rounds. Moore, who lived in the Patterson houses nearby, was hit several times. Paramedics rushed him by ambulance to Lincoln Hospital, but doctors could not save him. A second 16-year-old boy was shot in one of his arms during the confrontation, police said. He survived, but refused to cooperate with investigators. Moore was one of six children. He was a promising basketball player who honed his skills relentlessly, playing pickup games from morning until night. He played in all kinds of tournaments, basketball was his future. Regardless of which story is true, Johnny Moore lost his life, and Wally was the shooter. Also in 2011, Day Day went into Square Gang territory on another occasion with other 18 Park members, this time to retaliate against a Square Gang member who had stolen a jacket from an 18 Park member. Day Day shot at the Square Gang member, but no one was hit. 
In October of 2011, it's alleged that Square gang members attempted to get back at their rivals. A 16-year-old victim, identified as Dove Ogden, was found shot in the head in Mott Haven. Around 8 p.m., Dove Ogden was with others on East 145th Street and 3rd Avenue, 18 Park Territory. While they were chilling, the Square Gang Gunners, the YGs, showed up. The two rival groups got into a dispute with one another. Shots were reportedly fired at his group, and Dove Ogden was hit. It was unclear if he was involved. Cops were searching for the gunman. Allegedly, a YG member named Rampage committed the murder. By November of that year, 2011, Wally stood trial for the murder of Johnny Moore. At the courthouse, four court officers were injured and two of them hospitalized after a group of gang members assaulted them. During a tense murder trial, one court officer suffered a broken shoulder, while the others suffered less serious injuries. The mayhem broke out around noon. Tensions had been running high between the families of both teens, as they sat in Judge Troy Weber's courtroom in the Bronx Hall of Justice. They eventually began threatening each other in the courtroom pews, then brawled as the judge and lawyers looked on in shock. It was complete madness, said one witness. To see that kind of violence in a courthouse is disturbing. Five of the attackers were arrested and charged with assault, five others received summonses for disorderly conduct. The attackers are all believed to be affiliated with Wally. It didn't involve them and they shouldn't have gotten involved, said one teen involved in the brawl, in reference to the officers. He would beat the murder for now, but plead guilty to it later during the indictment of 18 Park. The violence had already escalated. The Square Gang and 18 Park would get into multiple shootouts with each other throughout the vicinity of the Patterson houses. On December 15, 2011, in the vicinity of 315 East 143rd Street in the Bronx, T. John's co-defendant and fellow 18 Park member, Will, aided and abetted by T. John, fired gunshots at an associate of the rivals. The rival gang member was struck and injured by the gunfire. On July 20, 2012, Bebo, who was responsible for gunning down Brandon Howard at a party three years prior, participated with others in 18 Park in stabbing and beating up a rival gang member at a barbershop. The victim survived, but had to be treated for stab wounds at a hospital. In separate events, shortly after this, there was evidence from police officers who described Chazing Corey immediately after a shooting at the Patterson Houses on September 15, 2012. Shell casings recovered by the police from that shooting matched the gun that Corey acknowledged that he possessed that day. Further, there was ballistics evidence that a gun that Corey had supplied to Naughty, a Caltech, had been fired on July 8, 2011, during a shootout with a rival gang member, in which Rara, an ally, was shot and wounded. Somewhere around this time, 18 Park member, Dante, would travel to another rival gang's territory, the Bettens' houses. He would take shots at rival gang members. It was unclear if anyone was hit though. Before the end of 2012, members of the rival Square gang would get indicted as a part of a drug conspiracy. Max, Twizzy, Reg, Omar and Shoes were all hit with narcotics charges. 18 Park would still be applying pressure. In 2013, Day Day served as a lookout to facilitate another 18 Park member in shooting at Square gang members. Again, no one was hit. Day Day also participated in 18 Park's drug trade. Day Day's participation was partly as a steerer, someone who would direct narcotics customers to dealers affiliated with 18 Park. As for Jason, despite having served a four-year prison sentence for the 2009 shooting described earlier in the story, shortly after his release from prison in 2013, he once again shot at rival gang members. T. John was another 18 Park member. On September 24, 2013, in the vicinity of 308 East 145th Street, T. John planned to shoot and kill a rival gang member. He discharged a weapon on this occasion, but did not hit anybody. T. John was confronted by the police and brandished a firearm, pointing it at one of the police officers who confronted him and putting that officer in reasonable apprehension of immediate bodily harm. Almost three months after this, on December 12, 2013, 18 park members were at the stash house when police officers raided it. Corey tried to bar the door to delay their entry, while the other 18 park member destroyed some of the drugs that were present inside the apartment. Let's jump over to the square gang for a minute. As for the Square Gang, Dummer, along with guys like Tay, were the most notable YGs in during this time period. June, 2014. Dummer was charged with attempted murder of a police officer and criminal possession of a loaded gun after shots were fired at East 145th Street and 3rd Avenue. 
the officer, who joined the NYPD the year prior, took off his hat so it wouldn't fly off his head, and a bullet tore through it while he held it in his hand. It was alleged that he was fleeing from shooting a 15-year-old 18 Park rival just moments before. Dummer would be on the receiving end of the same fate just a few months later. In October of 2014, he would get into an unexpected shootout with known 18 Park shooter, Wally. It's unclear who Wally was with. All we know is that he was accompanied by the youngest 18th Park member of the crew. Dummer and Wally exchanged gunfire, and during the blaze of bullets, Wally shot the gray brim hat off of Dummer's head. Crazy. In August or September 2014, in the vicinity of 331 East 146th Street, T. John's co-defendant and fellow 18 Park member John fired gunshots at two associates of a rival gang. After the shooting, at which T. John was not present, Harris handed the gun he had used to T. John. T. John hid the gun in another 18 Park member's apartment. This shooting took place near their own territory, so the two people they were shooting at probably shouldn't have been there. 2015 would be a deadly year as well, as the two gangs continued to duke it out. On April 15, 2015, the youngest member of the crew accompanied another 18 Park member when the other member stabbed and injured a member of a rival gang. The Square Gang was very active over the years since merging with YG's, allegedly, they were even going at it with fellow YG's members from across the street, the Mott Haven Houses. At the end of May, in 2015, Tariff Combs, 21, was fatally stabbed in front of the Bronx's Mott Haven Houses on East 143rd Street about 1.30 a.m., police said. A 21-year-old man was found shot in the left elbow a short distance away, but it was unclear if the two attacks were related. Tariff left behind a two-year-old daughter. Rumor has it, he was getting money in Delaware. The younger brother of Huli, a rapper known as 80 Reef, also from the Mott Haven Houses, did a tribute in honor of Tariff. On July 29, 2015, in the vicinity of 326 East 148th Street, T. John aided and abetted the youngest 18 Park member, who fired gunshots at an associate of a rival gang. This incident was an attempted murder that, had it been accomplished, would have constituted a first-degree murder. Violence was not the only aspect of 18 Park's operations that T. John was involved in. T. John also helped 18 Park sell drugs. While T. John's personal involvement focused on marijuana, he helped effectuate crack sales, understood and agreed to the large scope of the gang's crack dealing, and had access to the apartment of a guy named Christian, one of the hubs of the gang's drug dealing, to facilitate drug deals. As for the youngest member of the bunch, he was captured on intercepted phone calls interacting with Keyes, a leader of 18 Park's drug distribution operations. The youngest member was handling cash and illegal drugs and interacting with customers, more of a steerer than a full-blown drug dealer. In addition to the violence, in October 2015, Bebo shot a rival drug dealer in the leg in front of the deli on Spanish block. The Square Gang YGs were the last branch to be indicted in the Patterson houses due to violence. Shortly after, another murder took place in front of the Square Gang territory. In 2018, when authorities arrived at the scene, they discovered the body of Cheyenne Carter, a Crip member that goes by the name of 280 Shaw. Back in 2014, Carter was involved in an indictment stemming from turf wars with other Bronx gangs, including Dub City, WTG and Six Wild. He was a part of the 280 Crips. Anyway, rumors started to circulate that Cheyenne was informant in the 2014 280 indictment. He was associated with the Mitchell Projects, due to them being Crips as well. One day, he came into the Patterson houses waving a gun after getting cut in the face at a liquor store. He ended up getting murdered on May 26, 2018. Police say they found the 22-year-old unresponsive in front of 300 East 143rd Street outside the Patterson houses around midnight. He had two gunshot wounds, one to his head and one to his stomach. Carter was taken to Lincoln Hospital, where he was later pronounced dead. A 28-year-old dude named Pee Wee would be charged with a murder. After sitting up waiting for a trial for about four years, the outcome was a not guilty verdict, why BG Pee Wee comes home. This wasn't Pee Wee's first run-in with the law though. He had an attempt murder case back in 2011, when he shot a well-known guy from Mott Haven named Biggie. We will talk about that in a later video. Possibly the next one, since we are in Mott Haven at the moment. But yay, he would plead a weapons possession and get only two years for that situation. As leaders of 18 Park, Bebo got 30 years and Keyes got 35 years. 
Also, Wally was hit with 262 months in prison. But this about wraps up this story for this timeline, as always, stay low, and thanks for watching.